Hi, Dr. Rajbansi. Yes. Can you hear me? I'm Dr. Wang. Uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Uh, uh, can you help to introduce the first two speakers and presentations? And okay. I share the last two. All right, two sure. Okay. sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Hello? Hello? Yes, Dr. Ababa. Now we can see you. Thank you. Uh, we thank, can you. See your thank you. Thank wow. yeah. you. Go ahead. Go experience. Yeah, experience. Yeah, Technical great. issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good so good glad generation, you, you know. Yeah, okay. No problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll be starting <laughs> soon, <laughs> just in time. <laughs> just right on time. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Chairman, time is up. Okay. Uh, should I start? Yeah, yeah you please. can start now. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to wherever you are. On, um, on behalf of uh, Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology, I would uh, like to welcome you to this uh, APSC Cloud Forum of Cardiovascular Disease Series. And uh, this series and forum is going to comprise of Therapeutic strategies confronting variation in acute myocardial infarction, and uh, we have um, uh, interesting talks and uh, uh, a great forum. Uh, so, uh, first, the acute myocardial infarction is a life-threatening cardiovascular event resulting from acute occlusion of coronary arteries or arteries indicative of emergency management. Although mostly related to coronary plaque rupture with acute thrombosis, uh, acute myocardial infarction varies a lot in manifestation, including uh, AMI with non-obstructive obstructive coronary artery, the Minoka, Tokotsubo syndrome or cardiomyopathy, AMI with cardiogenic shock, and AMI with multivessel disease. Different therapeutic strategies, different short-term and long-term outcomes are expected. Serious decision-making steps and pitfalls are to be presented in this webinar. Uh, so I am uh, Bijoy Rajbanshi. I'm a cardiovascular surgeon. I work at uh, the Nepal Medicity Hospital in Kathmandu, and I'm also the president of Cardiac Society of Nepal. My co-chair for this <laughs> webinar is uh, Dr. Yi Chi Wong, He's a, a clinical associate professor at the Division of Cardiology and Department of Internal Medicine at National Taiwan University College of Medicine uh, at uh, National Taiwan University Hospital, Taipei, Taiwan. And um, there are a few disclaimers that we would like to mention. The content of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and should not be distributed without the prior permission of APSC. The view and opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the faculty members 
and do not necessarily represent those of APSC. And another housekeeping, the live streaming content of this, uh, of this webinar will be made available via APSC Cloud, APSC Facebook, and YouTube page. So let's get started with the, with the webinar. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all our first speaker, Dr. Supawat Ratanpo. He's from Thailand, and he's working at the Cardiovascular Disease Division at Department of Medicine in Framong Putlo Hospital and College of Medicine in Bangkok, Thailand. And he's going to be talking on myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, Minoka emergency, intervention or medical. Uh, Dr. Ratanpo. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rashpanchi for introduction. Uh, it's my honor to join APSC uh, Cloud webinar today. Um, and Thailand is still a morning time, but uh, let me show my slide. So today I would like to talk about myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries or what we call MINOGA. Let's see that uh, we need emergency intervention or just medical treatment. I don't have any disclosure regarding this topic. We will talk about the definition of MINOGA, how we diagnose the MINOGA approach and current management per uh, society statement. And we see what medical therapy or invasive treatment that we can offer to this group of patients. Let's first start with my case. It's a 60 years old Thai female with history of our AMI with a primary PCI to proximal to mid LED six years ago, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, claustrophobia, and morbid obesity. The patient presented to my clinic with a progressive chest pain for three days. We check uh, in the ECG, it looked like a have a kill or infarction, and we check the troponin at a zero and one ounce. It rising from 24.5 to 27.8 with not bad on renal function. We did a bedside echocardiogram and have an EF 40 to 45% with entry wall hypokinesis and mild aneurysmal change. That may correlate to the ECG. So we send the patient for the cat lab and my colleague called back that uh, the patient did not have uh, many blockage. It's not that bad. So let's talk about Minoka. And this cat is fit to the criteria too. These are the patient medication. Everything look all right. Okay. Okay. Next, uh, we're going to talk about Minoka. What is the definition? How we diagnose the Minoka? So this current statement, we start with the first mention about Minoka is from EAC working groups in the 2015. Then later we have a HA uh, statement in 2019 followed with an ESC guideline on NST elevated ACS also mentioned about Minoka. There's some share that I would like to mention about the definition of a Minoka in those uh, guidelines. First of all, when we talk about Minoka, we talk about the patient have a MI, myocardial infarction. It defines as uh, you have a clinical of myocardial ischemia or injury along with the rising and falling of correct troponin with supportive evidence such as the abnormal echocardiogram, dynamic STT chain, or the symptom of chest pain. So Minoka is a subset of a myocardial infarction. Minoka, when we found that the patient have less than 50% stenosis of a major coronary artery, we define the patient as a Minoka. It can cause by coronary and non coronary pathology condition. In terminology, initially we talk about uh, anoka, inoka, uh, when we talk about non obstructive coronary artery. However, we're going to diag the patient as a minoka once the patient has a positive connect inside more than 99% of percentile. So when we look where is a minoka, we think the patient with a ischemic heart disease, the patient divide to chronic coronary syndrome and acute coronary syndrome. The minoka is in the arm of acute coronary syndrome. When you have found have elevated troponin and have a stenosis less than 50% on major coronary artery. When we look on the initial criteria in 2015, they define 
they need three things. First, the patient should have an AMI criteria, both positive PEDAC biomarkers and some evidence that support that the patient have an AMI. Second, the patient have a non-obstructive coronary artery or angiography. It either not specified have to be invasive or non-invasive. And then the patient know any, any clinical of other cause of a, that can rise in the troponin. But based on this guideline, that's one thing that is included as a minogar. You can see in the, some original papers, they still call as a minogar, such as myocarditis and hakosubo cardiomyopathy. Then EHA come with a statement in 2019 together with the updated of a EFC non-state NST SES guideline. They have a little bit change because of the old guideline in 2015, they use a third universal consensus of a myocardial infarction. But the new guideline use a fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction. So first of all, it's the same. You have a rising and falling of troponin plus evidence of uh, myocardial ischemia or infarction, like EKG symptoms or abnormal echocardiogram. Second, you have non-obstructive coronary artery defined as like a cirrhosis in major vessels, less than 50%. It can be in these three groups. First of all, almost normal coronary artery, just mild luminal irregularity, cirrhosis less than 30%, or the patient just moderate disease, 30 to 50 percent. The last thing that's the make difference. There's no specific other team diagnosis of clinical presentation. They rule out polyembolisms, sepsis, and also mention about myocarditis and tacosubo cardiomyopathy, not count as a minogar anymore. Okay. So when we look to the fourth universal definition of MI, we're gonna look just only MI type one and type two in the patient with minoka. So when we look through the minoka with the new definition, they also have a specific cause, like it can be from the plaque rupture, erosion, thrombosis, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, some uh, type two MI like a uh, supply demand mismatch, coronary spasms, or coronary microvascular dysfunction, the smaller blood vessel that we could not see by the eyes. They also mentioned about another cause of troponin I elevation ill in the initial guideline, they may count as the minogar, but nowadays it's not minogar anymore. As I told you, heart failure, tacosubo cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, PE, sepsis, not minogar. So we look through the uh, preference of minogar with a new criteria in a 27 largest clinical trial. We found that the, uh, the preference average around 6% on the patient with acute myocardial infarction. When we look through the uh, older data from the gusto 2 b when the patient present with an unstable angina, the patient tend to have more non ostrict coronary artery. The patient who have positive collectrobinin as a STEMI or NSTEMI have average degree of a non obstructive coronary around five to 7%. When we look for the prognosis of the patient with minoka, we found that uh, at 12 months, the patient have mortality around 3.4%. And when we look at the in-hospital mortality, it's around uh, close to 1%. When we compare the patient with a real STEMI with obstructive coronary artery, we now have a better prognosis. However, when we compare to the normal uh, with our evidence of MI at all, we also in increase the risk of mortality and morbidity in the long term. Next, I would like to talk about management of minoka. Should we do emergency intervention or just medical treatment? So first of all, before we approach, I talk about that we do angiogram, do all kind of stuff. There are some limitation of evidence that what should we do? When we uh, divide how to approach, I divide into four steps. First, emergency supportive care. Second, working diagnosis of minoka. Third, to give some cardioprotective therapy. And fourth, do a cost-targeted therapy for the patient with minoka. The first one, emergency supportive care. 
treat or life threatening arrhythmia or cardiac shock or unstable hemodynamics. Try to immediate the underlying mechanism that make the patient have minocar. Revascularization not always good therapy option in this case, and I can say in most cases of the patients. Then we go to minocar workup diagnosis. You have needed two step. First, we exclude disorder that mimicking acute myocardial infarction and cause of like a rising troponin, like a PE uh, myocarditis. Second, once we thought the patient uh, have a less than 50% stenosis and fit to the criteria of Minoka at per AHA recommendation, then we try to identify the cause that we can treat. This uh, initial workup from the uh, first statement in 2015, you can see that uh, they put up broadly what you, you should do, what invasive and lab test, and the question that what should we do first. Then AHA come with a, what we call traffic light sequence of diagnosis of Minoga. They divide into uh, three colors, like a traffic light. So let's see what is in. First of all, they make sure that you have diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction fit the criteria that have risen or fall of troponin, fit to the four universal uh, MI definition, either a type one or type two. Second, one we know is a MI, and we know that the patient have a less than 50% blockage, then we work on the working diagnosis to rule out that is it's real minoka. You have to make sure you don't overlook obstruction. Some obstruction, branch disease, may cause a rising troponin, and then we did not see it, and we thought it's just a minoka. Second, we work up on, on non-ischemic cause of myocardial injury. And last one, when we sure it's a minoka, we find the specific cause inside the coronary artery that uh, what can we treat for the patient. So on the traffic light again, I go back. They're going to put on the red one. You try to find out, as I told you, Second, you're working on the diagnosis by either kind of imaging, angiography, intravascular imaging. And then you work up on the cause that mainly focus intravascular. And they also mention about the physiologic study. When you see the patient with a blockage in the third group of the criteria, 30 to 50%, you might consider do the what we call FFR, physiologic test, to make sure that no ischemia. Therefore, one fourth of the patient Actually, the block is worse than we thought. But if the FFR normal is mean no ischemia or more than 0.8, we can diagnose the patient as a minoka. The ESC uh, 2020 s non STRBED ACS guideline come with the same things with a traffic light in the different direction. And they change the definition as an ASA. This, uh, the M like MRI intravascular imaging is a class one recommendation. And they also mentioned that uh, how important of a correct like MRI that we can use to screen the patient with Minoka. Keep in mind, even though we do a lot of our workup, 25% of the patient still we don't know the cost of Minoka. So there's uh, many uh, trial and research try to find the roles of uh, which assessment we should we use. MRI become a critical uh, that they can reclassify the patient up to 68% to myocarditis, Tocosubo, or nothing. Heart Monica uh, Minoka trials, uh, they try to combine uh, OCT, intravascular imaging, together with connect MRI in women. And we found that uh, in Minoka, in women, when we use OCT together with connect MRI, we can find the cost up to 84.5%. These are uh, some uh, example, what we find from the OCT, uh, intravascular imaging, like a plaque rupture, uh, intra plaque cavities, increase the plaque from the last plaque, comes from bus, or like uh, some spasms. These are example from the uh, MRI, what we found, and help us to rule out myocarditis, and also some infarction, or even tacosibo cardiomyopathy. So, from the uh, all imaging nowadays, what we use, especially in the green light, first we recommend to use MRI, and after angiogram, we may recommend to use uh, intravascular imaging. The first one is a uh, OCT 
or if you cannot use OCT, you can use IVARS. Then we can find the cause of minoga inside the coronary artery. Then if it's unclear, the blockage is bad or not bad, you may do a, some like a functional test or test for the, some coronary microvascular, like a, a provocating test. If we think the patient have a thrombus from the outside, we may do a TEE or thrombophilia workup. This one is interesting because uh, initially uh, from the research, they, they say that uh, we use only a query angiogram do a catheterization to make sure it's a more than or less than 50% stenosis. However, now we use a lot of a CT scan that have uh, more benefit. We found that uh, the CT scan uh, query CT in the right patients, we can have high pre negative pretty value up to 90.9% throughout obstructive query artery. So when we first screen in the red light, whether it's blocked or not blocked, now you have two options. Send the patient for query CT. If uh, you do not suspect the patient have a re uh, real obstructive query artery or send the patient to a routine standard angiogram. After we uh, find out the cause, then we do cardioprotective therapy. However, uh, the most of medication that we use nowadays is based on obstructive coronary artery. It not sure, we're not sure how much impact of, of the medication. From the sweet heart registry, they follow the patient with Minoka. Uh, most patient is uh, 80, 65 and 61% of women. Women have Minoka more than men. And found that the starting S inhibitors may have benefit for the patients. But you have to think that uh, on the Minoka, there's a Minoka who don't have any blockage at all. This group may not have benefit from any of medication. And also Minoka who have 30 to 50% stenosis. This group of patients may benefit from statin. So they also have a newer um, ongoing uh, trial called Minoka BAT trial. They try to see the impact of beta blocker or AC or ARB uh, to the patient and the result at four years is pending. Next, after we know the uh, diagnosis cause, like we do MRI, we do uh, intravascular imaging, we define the patient whether they have a plaque uh, disruption, vasospasm, chorea microvascular dysfunction, or the emboli or uh, chorea arterial dissection, or even a supply demand mismatch then we can treat the patient right. I have to say that all the ACS, prior erosion composed of around 25% in the Western data, but in, you, in the Asian data, it may even higher, especially younger population and women. On the practice disruption, there's no established role of pori PCI. Uh, mainstay therapy now is a DAP, aspirin, and a, a P2Y12 inhibitors. However, one year revascular rate is around 5.7% in the patient with Minoka that you have to keep in mind to follow these patients. Erosion study, they found that uh, even we don't put the stent or do any balloon, this patient is safe up to four years with just a DAP medication. Epidio, chorea vasospasm is another common cause of uh, Minoka in Thailand when we launch about marijuana, uh, for medical treat, we have a lot of cases with a vasospasm too. Uh, and this is diagnosis criteria of vasospasm. Chorea microvascular dysfunction, this is a new entity that we explore more and more. There's a proposed criteria by the COVIDIS group about the symptom of ischemia. You absent of chorea artery, this is a minoka. Have evidence of microdial ischemia, and when they have positive cardiac side, then you can diagnose minoka too. And then the last thing, have it end up in pericory microvascular function. Also, when they look uh, on the small group and a subgroup of a uh, pericory microvascular dysfunction, they also the group that have ACS, have positive cardiac and this group that we so call Minoka. So that's the criteria and how we work up uh, on the patient with vasospatum and CMD, both the uh, invasive test and like a microvascular function test. And this is scenario that we use, measure the pressure while do vasoreactive activity, and they be diagnosed both vasospasm and CMD. We don't have time to talk today, but uh, most of this group of patients, when we treat, we modify all the basic risk factors. 
that uh, we think is associated with chorey microvascular dysfunction. We have a medication like calcium channel blocker, wrong acting nitrate for vasospasms. We have medication like aspirin S or something that may work for chorey microvascular dysfunction. We also have a medication to relieve the pain like a lenolacine, a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker for this group of patients. The last is a chorey uh, emboli and thrombosis. The thrombosis can happen in the patient with a hypercoagulable disorder. Chorey emboli can be from an intra coronary or come from other source. The high risk group of patients, such as a prostatic heart valve, atrial fibrillation, low EF, dilated coronary rheumatic heart, infective endocarditis, or atrial myxoma, can cause chorey emboli. And chorey emboli sometimes can be bad, and you may need an aspiration to bring the thrombus or the clot out. The last thing that uh, is a uh, nightmare in the cat lab is a spontaneous chorea artery dissection. We found in the patient at a young age, the patient peripartum period is an increased risk. Also, history of fibromuscular dysplasia or migraine. The problem in this group of patients, nowadays, the patient can present with a STEMI. We inject, we found the blockage. When you put a more balloon, more stent, there's more dissection along the way. So PCI will reserve only the proximal vessels or the patient with unstable. If the patient have mid to distal a vessel lesion, we left it alone and repeat a query angiogram in two months. And we found that all vessel almost healed. Let's go back to our case. Our 60 years old who have a rising a troponin a bit. And then the colleague said that uh, after they do angiogram, they found only 40% uh, mid LED with the old stain restenosis. So I asked them uh, to do uh, intravascular imaging to find any cause. And uh, at that time, we don't have the OCT. We did uh, IWAS and show no, no any plaque erosion or anything at this point. However, we noticed the patient have all slow flow in all query artery. Then we also confirmed with a physiologic study, we do uh, IFR and FFR. The FFR is a 0.86, it's more than 0.8, so no ischemia in these patients. So the patient quite fit uh, to uh, the diagnosis of Minoga, and we thought it can be a slow fall related to a core uh, microcirculation. So one thing we want the patient to stay, to be sent for the correct MRI. The patient have claustrophobia, so send the patient. We send the patient to for correct straight PET scan instead. One the, the patient is stable, and we found no perfusion defect, but the patient have a lower core flow reserve and core myocardial blood flow. So we it fit the criteria of a core microvascular dysfunction. We give the patient an adapt because the patient is rising a troponin. We modify mm -hmm. risk factor and our medication. So the last thing uh, from uh, my talk today, I have to say Minoka is not the same entity. Uh, they can cause by heterogeneous group of uh, disease. Chorea angiogram or even a CT scan is an initial rule out to determine that the patient has significant blockage or not. More data on the intravascular imaging plus CREC MRI is a good tool uh, to work up on Minoka. From the current evidence, I have to say Minoka is a better biomedical treat except some certain condition like an emergency uh, condition, hemodynamic instability, some chorea arterial dissection in the proximal vessels, some certain uh, chorea thrombosis or emboli that you need aspiration, that need intervention. This uh, idea, um, I will not focus, that uh, what presentation on Minoka, what kind of diagnosis, and what uh, therapy that uh, they need. And these are all the intracoronary. You can see that actually uh, MODS is a medication, it's not the uh, intervention and try to identify the cause. OCT and MRI combined together, you can uh, work up cause around 80% of the patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ratanpo. I think it's an um, extensive and a uh, very elaborate uh, 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 topic and you've uh, really you know, expressed it very well. Do we have any time? Do we have time for any questions? Uh, does anyone have any questions? Can I can I have a question for Dr. Ratanpo? Okay. 
uh, we know that the intravascular imaging is very important for, for Minoka, but uh, how about the tips and tricks to use OCT or IVAS for this patient? Should we screen for the O3 coronary vessels or just for one lesion we suspect? Okay, thank you, Dr. Wang. That's a great question. Uh, because we always, we don't know where the troponin comes from. So uh, we have to go uh, with the clinical too. Like uh, if the patient have uh, some uh, echocardiogram change, then we can focus on uh, some, just only some certain vessels. OCT is always the first choice in case of uh, Minoka because uh, you can see the better, uh, like a plaque erosion. Sometimes we just see only a small thrombus lying on the endothelium that you can miss from the IWAS. So for me, I focus on just a certain vessels, uh, mainly uh, like uh, related to the clinical, but there is some case that we're not so sure, like uh, we inject and the patient have uh, all three vessels, then you have to select because you cannot do an OCT all three vessels and then they're gonna use a lot of contrast. In that case, I may consider uh, intravascular ultrasound, but if a patient all is a 30% blockage, 30 to 50%. Sometimes we skip where the patient to be stabilized. We don't put the Y in at all. And then you, we select non-selective, uh, non-invasive correct imaging later, like an MI straight test, PET scan, nucleus scan. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I believe in the interest of time, we should move into our, our second speaker. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Suji Braj Bandari. He's associated with the National Academy of Medical Science. He's a senior consultant cardiologist and uh, he's the head of department of Department of Cardiology at Shahid Gangalal National Heart Center in Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, Dr. Raj Bandari is gonna be talking on Takotsubo syndrome, emergency therapeutic strategy and outcome. Dr. Raj Bandari. Thank you, Dr. Bizet, for kind introduction. I was a little bit late because I was holed up in traffic. So uh, good morning to all of the participants. Uh, so I'll be starting. Uh, I'll be sharing the <clears throat> oh, photo document. How do I say the screen? Sorry. How do I share the... I want to share the... It's in my desktop. How do I share? Mm. Well, you roll over your mouse to the button. Uh, documents. You okay, documents. Yeah. Allow. It's easier. So yeah. let me see. Mm. Okay, images, document, documents, documents. Showing. Actually, it's in my uh, screen. Uh, action, action, action. Yeah, you can share. There is a button on the mm. center, lower center part. Uh, usually, it's green. It's green color. Uh, no, it green. Uh, yeah, I know. That's why. Yeah, okay. I know. Uh, let me. Uh, Sorry for the delay. <clears throat> Sorry. It's hung. I think my it got hung. Mm. I downloaded it in just a minute. Excuse me for that. Sorry for the delay. Mm.
share a screen. Something. I want to share the screen, but it's not working. Dr. Uh, there's a button at the bottom. Oh, there's a button, you know, I put it in my, so I'm using my, uh, this uh, mobile. So it's still, okay, so, okay. There's a button, I know there's a button, uh, which from where I can see the screen, but uh, this one, I know. Usually it's a green button. Oh, yeah. green, but I didn't see the green. There's a share screen. Okay, green button, okay. Yeah, share screen and uh, click the share screen, screen you like there. to share. But and, uh, uh, start. it may. Oh. Somehow it's not coming in my... I've downloaded my thing, but it's not coming. I don't know why. It's the screen is in the there. Isn't I'm using my uh, uh, mobile Mob phone because that the uh, mobile phone. Yeah, we usually is still working, and you can try. But uh, your PowerPoint is in your desktop or in your yeah, PowerPoint. Yeah. I've downloaded, but it's not. Doctor Pichar, yes, yeah, okay, he's he's come back. I hope he's okay. He seems uh, he left. Yeah. Oh, oh, something wrong. He's connecting. He's a may taking issue. Okay, so yes, please. Is he logged he, in? You no, know, he, he just, he, he logged out and he's coming. He's coming. Okay. I, I already, you now he has his skin and the connect. Yeah. I hope he's, hi. Hi, Dr. Yeah. We can see you now. And uh, please, please, please continue. Yes. Dr. Sujip, you are you are you okay? You can carry on your presentation. Uh, we can't hear you. Actually, we know yeah, you we are talking, you. but we can't hear your voice. <clears throat> oh yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> it's uh, okay. Great. We can see your your mobile phone. Your my mobile phone is uh, is working, and uh, we are watching your mobile phone's content, and uh, your presentation is in your mobile phone. Okay. Maybe you uh, rotate 90 degree. We will get a full screen of your presentation. Uh oh, it's just disappear. It's gone. It's disappeared again. Oh. 
it's not in, he, maybe he look out or accidentally he disconnected. So I will keep on watching the, he's coming or not. Perhaps you can carry on for the next speaker swap switch between these two speakers. Yes, I, I, I think so. So um, I think one. let's move on to the the third speaker because I guess uh, with these webinars and the internet is unstable, we some certain things we cannot control. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our uh, second speaker, Dr. Yoon Kook Kim from Korea. He's a professor and uh, at the Department of Cardiology Heart Center in Chosun University Medical School in Chosun University Hospital in Guangzhou, Korea. And he's going to be talking to us about interventional strategy for multivessel acute myocardial infarction, IRA only or complete revascularization. Uh, Dr. Kim. Thanks, Chairman. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chairman. I'm Hyungkook Kim from Joseon University Hospital. It's my great honor to participate in the APCSC webinar. My topic is about uh, interventional strategy of multi vessel AMI. There are three parts in my presentation. The first part is about clinical impact of multi vessel AMI. In early 20s study, AMI patient with multiple plaque associated with the recurrent ACS and revascularization compared with a single plaque. According to the representative uh, 2010s study, about 50% of patients of AMI had multiverse disease and patients with uh, non-RA disease had a significantly higher mortality rate compared with uh, without non-IR disease. We can assume the regions of these results by the prospect trial. Uh, the prospect trial included 697 HS patients who underwent angiogram and simultaneously a three vessel IBUS during the median 3.4 years follow up. Surprisingly, non IR related events uh, were developed similar with the IR related events. Uh, the major risk factors of non IRE region events were the presence of syncephy raceroma and minimal lumen area and large amount of plaque burden. In my personal opinion, there are three regions of more events in multivessel AMI patients. First, AMI patients were more vulnerable. In these two studies, show that more events occurred in patients in Asia compared with the stable ischemic heart disease with a similar ischemic burden reflected by a fractional flow reserve values. We can see that uh, clinical events could be developed more in AMI patients, even in non-ischemic vessel regions. Second, uh, Korean plate thrombosis research team, including me, recently reported that AMI patients had more thrombogenic features than non-AMI patients. We used the thromboelastography, uh, which showed the global hemostasis for checking the thrombogeneity. Higher maximal amplitude reflects stronger platelet fibrous club strength, and lower lysis 30 reflects impaired fibrolysis. So the uh, maximal amplitude and LI30 LI were independent predictors of AMI presentation and associated with the uh, four-year major adverse cardiac events in the risk registry. Third, in preclinical studies, myocardial infarction events itself associated with the disease progression in remote vascular area. This study uh, used the double knockout mice, ideal receptor at upper back one, and then uh, MI was induced by a coronary ligation and they observed the uh, remote vessel plaque progression in aorta, atherosclerotic plaque. The, the, uh, in this uh, experiment showed that uh, in AMI, AMI group, uh, the plaque progression and inflammation reaction was a prominent 
in the AMI group compared with the same procedure. This study was performed by my post research team. In day zero, uh, we made the AMI model by cry occlusion by balloon catheter, and the other one performed the same procedure. And then day two after the procedure, we performed the stain implantation both in the IRA and non-IRA. Simultaneously for observation of both the IRA and non-IRA region were associated more endocellular dysfunction replaced by the acetic choline challenge test. And then more observed peristrate inflammation and fibrin in the AMI group and more plaque progression in the AMI group compared with the sham procedure group. The second part of my presentation is about complete revascularization versus IRA only. Complete, complete revascularization was not recommended due to the safety concern in two, 2013 ACCFHA yeah, guideline for STEMI guideline. But this recommendation was based on the registry data or several analysis of RCT or, uh, or our registered registry data set. We can see that retrospective studies tended to favor IR only but prospect studies is a neutral event effect. In 2017, is the ESC guideline for STEMI made two A recommendation for complete revascularization based on the ICTs, including PRAMI and CULPRIT, COMPARE ACUTE, and DANAI PRE3 multi trial. However, it said PRAMI trial, the benefits of CR was mainly by reduced revascularization rather than the SMI, the hardware endpoint. And in Dunstemi, also made two A recommendations for the CR, but level of agency C because of lack of RCTs, mainly driven by observational studies. In, nine, in 2019, a game-changing trial uh, for this issue was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They named the complete trial, a complete trial in order most largest number of STEM patients compared with the previous ICTs and show the CR reduced the death or myocardial impression that is a hard endpoint than IONI PCI. Based on the result of complete trial, uh, 2020 first ACCHA Sky guideline made a class one recommendation and level of evidence A for CR in STEMI patients. Therefore, CR or non-CR, especially STEMI, it's not the issue anymore. The third part is the remaining issues when and how to achieve CR in AMI patients. The first is the immediate CR. Multivessel AMI with cardiac shot in guideline recommended uh, should not be performed in patient AMI complicated by, by cardiac shot. These recommendations are almost based on the one powerful RCT. The cautious point is that uh, guideline prohibited immediate CR, not CR itself. In the corporate shock trial, in immediate CR increased deaths and no benefits in the early phase in, over the CR and no, uh, no benefit in the longer term follow up. The remaining issue in corporate shock trial, uh, they made the one David, uh, in the corporal region only PCI group, 149 patients survived in corporal only PCI group, but 30 or 50% patients made a CR. So maybe they increased benefit of corporal only PCI group. And then they included 20% of CTO patients. But in our Korean data, uh, decision CTO trial published in circulation, they showed that CTO PCI has a little or no significant effect compared with the just medical therapy. And then they reported that in one year data, the hospitalization for congested heart failure is, is more developed in the culprit only PCI group. Now recently uh, in the ACC rate breaking 
multi-vessel AMI with a cardiac shock, a biovascular trial was published, Simon's published in Lancet. It's a prospective and open level and non-imperial trial. Inpatient presented ACS and multiple disease, immediate CR was not imperial to the uh, staged CR. And they show that myocardial impaction or ischemic driven revascularization was lower in the immediate CR, but it is the imperial, non-imperial trial, so you cannot conclude that it is superior than the staged CR. There are several upcoming studies about these issues, including option STEMI on the enrollment in Korea. Uh, it, it's the enrollment rate is 90%. So, so we can see the result of these studies for the seek the answer for these issues. Second is angiography only PCI versus physiologic guided PCI for the CR. Uh, there are many cardiologists or interventionists uh, did not believe the FFR value in the non IR region in the AMI patients. So we, we make a PGR experiment with uh, Jung Lee in Samsung Medical Center and Lim in Korea uh, Research Center. So we made a post-sign experiment using a microsphere and a Doppler wire and something. So we report that non IR FFR reliable except unstable bias tellers because in the microsphere insertion, IR region arising the IMR, so microvascular injury, and then FFR value uh, elevated uh, according to the microvascular injury. But in non microsphere, non, non IR region, no, no, there is no significant change in the IMR and FFR values. And it's a pathology, no microvascular injury region. CFR and IMR was intact, and, and the region of microvascular injury is a necrosis in the, this myocardium and microvasculature. It showed the microvascular dysfunction according to the CFR and IMR somodilution method. And then we, we also saw the balloon occlusion in the circumflex and then checked the Doppler wire as uh, AP. Uh, peak velocity using a Doppler wire. It showed the low change in the FFR value in non IR region. The first RCT about angiography versus FFR guided CR is the flower AMI trial. It is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They show that no, there are no differences between the FFR revascularization and angiography guided revascularization. But this study is very some limitation in that study. Because the PCR rate was only 55% in the FFR group, it's a very uh, lower the PCI, but two times higher paid pressure MI in FFR guided group, and only 70% non IR PCI in FFR group resulting in TIMI 3 flow. So it means that 30% of non IR PCI in FFR group was below the TIMI 2 flow. And then angioguides group showed a 3.5 times higher incidence of cardiac death, mainly sudden cardiac death than FFR guided group. And 16% of non-IR FFR data was missing. No core laboratory analysis for FFR in the flower AMI. So it is our uh, country data. The second ICT for these issues is a frame AMI trial. They can show the angioguided CR was inferior to FFR guided, but uh, according to the COVID-19 situation, we cannot early termination, so it is has uh, some limited power. So we made a, a frame and by QFR sub-study for explaining the results. They show that in we use the angiographed FFR value is a QFR. It, it can base uh, the angiography itself, and they show that high F QFR and PCI group in the angiography guided PCI show the worst outcome and similar with the low uh, superior result of FFR guided PCI. Uh, Dr. Samuel Meta uh, write the editorial for our frame AMI trial. They, he, he said the difference between the two, due to trial is uh, some one, first one is a reliable FFR measurement and 60% immediate PCI and 48% include non STEMI, and we have a longer duration. And they say that they will be make a complete two trial, a STEMI or non STEMI with multiple coronary disease, and number is 5,000 patients. And then maybe we can see the 
uh, answer for the, these issues. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my summary. The first one is multi-based AMI uh, is associated with the worst outcomes compared with non AMI and single single vessel. And complete vascularization is class one and level of evidence A in STEMI and maybe beneficial in non-STEMI patients. And the remaining issues went to and how to achieve complete revascularization is awaiting or coming ICTs about these issues. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Kim. Uh, do we have any questions? May I have a question <clears throat> for Dr. Kim? <clears throat> I we know that, uh, from your slide, we, we see that uh, the CTO lesion is about 20% in AMI mm -hmm. patients with multivessel disease. And we know that uh, sometimes the IRA supply the collateral to the CTO lesion, but uh, some are not. Is there any difference when we treat these, these two different kind of situation? Uh, in in cardiac shock patient? No, no, it's stable patient. Ah, uh, stable patient. Uh, in our in our country, uh, we have a, a MI registry named the Camille data. They reported that uh, there are there are uh, no significant changes uh, differences between the two groups. Uh, okay. I think that uh, it, maybe prognosis is similar, but maybe. Yeah. Thank you for your great okay. question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, I'd like to request my co-chair, Professor Wong, to kindly take over. Okay, maybe is Dr. Suji ready? We cannot hear you, Dr. Suji. <laughs> Uh, okay, we can okay, see your okay, presentation. Okay, we can see your slide. I think that uh, uh, maybe Dr. Suji can proceed his presentation. Please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Intermittent. Uh, not, not so clear, but not it, very clear. You. So I'm talking about some cardiomyopathy. Of some of the 
started by my in 90% of
<coughs> Thank you, Dr. Suzy. <laughs> I'm sorry that we cannot hear your sound very clearly, but uh, your slides are very clear. And uh, any questions from the audience or the panelists? May I have a, maybe I have a short question. I, I, I saw in your slide that uh, IABP is a choice for tapotable disease where with LVOT obstruction, but I think IABP will decrease the afterload and may exacerbate the degree of LVOT obstruction. How about the use of this kind of device in such situation? <laughs> Sorry, what is the other? Suji, please stop sharing your presentation. Maybe you will make the voice yeah, more yeah. clearly. Yeah, yeah, the sound is not very clear. Maybe. Please stop sharing so that, uh, yeah, the bandwidth can go through your audio. We still cannot hear hear your voice. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you for your <laughs> lecture. And uh, maybe we have to move to the next session. And uh, it's my honor to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Bassam Ababa from the United Arab Emirates. Dr. Ababa is the professor and the consultant of cardiology and the interventional cardiology at Al Qasimi Hospital. And can and his Topic today is acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock, role of mechanical circulatory support. Dr. Ababa, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you. First, uh, hello everyone. I would like to thank the organizing committee for sharing me in this session. I am sharing now from Germany still it is night time. Uh, so uh, this is my talk. There is no uh, nothing for disclosure. This is my agenda in my talk. Uh, I will start with background and introduction. As you know, that cardiogenic shock complicates uh, acute ST. Doctor, Dr. Ababa, can you share yes. your slide? Share your slide. I share. It is not sharing. Yeah, we cannot see your slide. You can see my slide? Yes, we cannot see. You can see or not? Okay, we cannot see your slide. You cannot see? Yeah. Now? <laughs> You can see my slide or not? Not, not. Even like this? You cannot see, huh? Yeah, can, uh, cannot, we cannot. Okay, it's okay.
Okay. Okay. okay. And make it full screen. It's okay without full screen. Uh, maybe you can use the full screen. Please uh, start display actually your presentation. Start your presentation yeah. on the yes, yes, left. Yes, I will start. Uh, right but now point. it is not full screen. How can yeah. I make it full screen by press? Are you using uh, the dual screen? Do you have a dual screen? Two I screen have, in, your, have, in front of you. I have icon for, but uh, what happened is that something. Okay. Yeah, you can, there is a left, a lower right hand side. Yeah, that's the play, okay. display. Okay. 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 okay, great. This okay. is Thank my you. agenda. This is first, uh, this is my talk. Uh, this is my agenda. I will start with uh, background, cardiogenic shock, complicated ST elevation MI in five to 10%. Despite immediate revascularization and pharmacological support, mortality is still very high. In ST elevation myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock is uh, typically due to ventricle pump failure, but there is some cases we have to recognize that mechanical complication may be implicated. Uh, Short-term mechanical circulatory support devices acutely improve hemodynamic condition, but they are not free of potential complication uh, behind the cost. Evidence uh, to guide this treatment is low really, and the use of based on, uh, uh, is based on expert consensus, conflicting retro, retrospective studies and the small underpowered randomized trial. Uh, etiology of cardiogenic shock, it is uh, multi, uh, ranging from uh, uh, acute MI and uh, mechanical complication uh, to cardiac tamponade to two. But uh, of course, my talk, it is about ST elevation MI and cardiogenic shock. And the, spec the spectrum of cardiogenic shock, it is really wide, ranging from pre-shock status to mild shock uh, and profound shock and refractory shock. And the management is different with each, each step of this spectrum and the prognosis is completely different between step and step. So early recognition, early management is must and is essential and it makes sense in management of this uh, complication. Uh, you know that the prognosis uh, regarding cardiogenic shock is different if it is related to acute MI or related to the heart failure. The, and the prognosis in case of acute MI is worse than that uh, associated with acute are for failure. So this is less tolerance uh, of hemo, uh, hemometabolic perfusion in case of uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction. I will start with this registry, new registry uh, for uh, 18 years coming from USA as they recognized 4.3 million ST elevation admission and cardiogenic shock percentage, it was 8.5. And during this 18 years, they noticed the increase that the incidence of cardiogenic shock increased 
significantly from 5.8 in 2000 to 13.0 uh, in 2017. And also multi-organ uh, failure increased in significant way from 2012 till 2017. And also the angio and BCI increase in significant way in this period. And the use of intraortic ballon bump during this time, which is too long time, it decreased. Uh, while uh, another mechanical assistant device uh, use uh, in, in cardiogenic shock increased from 0% to 12.9%. And the hospital mortality decreased in significant way from 49, 49.6% uh, 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 to 32.7%. Uh, 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 so decreased, so the mortality decreased, risk decreased. Uh, this is a family of uh, mechanical circulatory support uh, devices, uh, which uh, for, for temporary use, uh, short, yani, I mean short mechanical circulatory support, starting from intraortic ballon bomb, Imbella uh, family, tandem family, ECMO family, uh, and uh, Centrimag. And some of them are uh, uh, recruited uh, to have evidence benefit uh, for LV uh, left ventricular uh, failure and uh, other for right ventricular failure. And some of them, we can get from them benefit for both like VA ECMO. Uh, what about intraortic ballon bump? You know, is, uh, this is the first used in, uh, in uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, complicating ST elevation MI. Uh, and uh, according to this analysis, uh, this study, which is intraortic ballon bump shock two trials, uh, which is published published 2013, uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, at 30 years, there is no difference in mortality between the two arm if we use uh, intraortic ballon bump or not. And the same result extend to more than one year. Uh, the, also, there is no difference uh, regarding mortality between the, the two group uh, if we use uh, intraortic ballon bump or not. So according to that, the uh, guidelines uh, uh, shift uh, the uh, recommendation uh, for using intraortic ballon bomb in cardiogenic shock from 1C to 3B. So it is now not recommended to be used as a routine, uh, but sometimes we, can, we have to use it, but we, it is uh, recommended not to use it uh, as a routine. What other family of this uh, group of mechanical circulatory support? Uh, you know uh, that there is another member in this family, including uh, VA ECMO and uh, Tandem Heart, Embella CB, and Embella RP. And each of them have different way uh, and uh, they recruit different axes. For uh, example, for VA ECMO, uh, they uh, recruit uh, cable vein and aorta uh, as destination. And for Embella RB from right atrium to pulmonary artery for destination. And for tandem heart from left atrium to aorta and for left embella, uh, it is a left ventricle to proximal embella. And regarding the intraortic ballon bump, as you know, from proximal aorta to aorta. So, which devices and when to go for it? Uh, really, it is rely in which ventricle is affected uh, in uh, during 
a, a cardiogenic shock complicating ST elevation in mind. Most of the cases, it is either left ventricle or biventricle in 93% of the cases. But RV, uh, isolated RV, RV affected only in several percent of cases like RVMI, especially if complicated with complete heart block. This is the Ambella family. The most uh, used is Embella CB be, because uh, it may uh, 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 provide a four liters uh, 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 supply uh, for me, uh, in each minute. And uh, it can be done through, through bare cutaneous puncture. While Embella uh, 5, it need uh, cut down at the femoral side. And in the Embella 2.5, it is uh, uh, the uh, effective uh, of it, it is uh, minimal. Uh, and also there is Embella RB, uh, which uh, bumping, which uh, bumping the, the blood, transfers the, the blood from the uh, right atrium to the ascending aorta. And also regarding bare cutaneous VA ECMO, uh, which uh, uh, extracted blood from right uh, atrium to uh, external ox oxygenator, then, then transfer the blood uh, to the aorta. And there is some complication regarding this, uh, like uh, limb ischemia and increased left ventricle afterload, so may precipitate pulmonary edema. So there is question should be raised, is there a mortality benefit by mechanical circulatory support? And uh, uh, what about evidence from uh, uh, matched uh, comparisons? First, we have to know, uh, we have to balance uh, between the risk or complication uh, from inserting this kind of devices uh, and the benefit uh, for getting the high cost of these uh, devices. And uh, we remind ourselves of complications like hemorrhage, infection, hemolysis, limb ischemia, embolic, and the thrombotic event relate, related to these devices. I will uh, start uh, with this matching study, uh, which uh, matched uh, Embella, uh, supporting a uh, patient coming with cardiogenic shock complicating acute ST elevation MI, and the result coming from shock 2 trials uh, regarding the efficacy of intraortic balloon bomb, and this is published in 2019. Uh, the result it was shocking, no benefit regarding mortality between Embella versus uh, intraortic balloon bomb in this matched comparison. And so you can recognize no difference regarding mortality, but the peripheral complication and the bleeding and also sepsis uh, all higher in significant statistic. Uh, evidence uh, uh, in uh, Embella arm. The same if you uh, compare in this matching study between Embella uh, and intraortic balloon uh, uh, bomb, which is more recent than the previous one, which is published in 2020, uh, and uh, recruit a higher number of patients uh, comparing Embella and intraortic balloon bomb, the death, it was higher in significant way in the Embella, Embella uh, arm. And also the major bleeding higher in significant way in the Embella uh, arm. So uh, uh, here you can recognize also in third matching study, uh, how the uh, intra survival with intraortic balloon bump is better than in Bella. 
So what about uh, the Japanese experience and the registry regarding using this mechanical uh, circulatory support, which is uh, published uh, recently? Uh, and they found that if we use Ambella alone or Ambella with ECMO, uh, the benefit is better regarding survival if we use Ambella alone. So adding ECMO, uh, VA ECMO, uh, uh, it decreases the survival benefit or it make uh, it is the survival uh, benefit. It is much, much, uh, uh, the survival, it was only 45.7%. Uh, but if we use Embella alone, the survival, it is double. It is 80.9%. Another meta and another, another from Japanese also uh, registry, uh, which is recently published, that they compare uh, if we use uh, VA ECMO plus intraortic balloon bump, or uh, we use uh, only uh, uh, VA ECMO plus or VA ECMO, uh, VA ECMO uh, plus intraortic balloon bump, or if we use only VA ECMO. So the survival rate, if we use intraortic pabulum bump with uh, ECMO, uh, it is better. Because as I mentioned before, that uh, ECMO may increase the afterload of the left ventricle, so may precipitate pulmonary edema. So this study sounding uh, regarding the benefit of adding VA ECMO plus intraortic balloon bump to increase survival in patient presenting with ST elevation MI and uh, cardiogenic shock. But uh, the registry coming from uh, uh, USA regarding uh, this combination of uh, VA ECMO and intraortic balloon bump uh, uh, have uh, uh, um, fair uh, result that there is no difference uh, between uh, the two arm if we use VA ECMO alone or if we use VA ECMO, VA ECMO with intraortic balloon uh, bump. But the bleeding, the hemolysis with the arm of using both is high. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, again, uh, this study from USA, it is recruiting in Bella versus uh, intraortic pallone bump in patient uh, using VA ECMO. And the result regarding survival, it is the same, but the hemolysis, uh, it is higher if we use uh, ECMO with Embella. So it is different from the Japanese study. How to triage to uh, mechanical circulatory support? Uh, first, we have to use BAC guided uh, uh, to guide it, to guide us. Uh, first, we have to ask our question, uh, self the question: What level and type of shock our patient, uh, and what devices need, and what is uh, post device management and should be all done in a, a, a quick heart team meeting uh, for this kind of cases, which should be done on time without losing any time because uh, time is muscle and time is survival in patient uh, with uh, ST elevation, MI complicating with cardiogenic shock. Uh, this is a potential strategy for, uh, for ge in, uh, general strategy uh, to deal with patient uh, uh, with shock from acute ST elevation MI. First, uh, we have to use Embella CB, which is uh, the best and it is easy and uh, it is time consuming. There is no delay. It take uh, about 12 minutes uh, to be inserted. Then we reassess the patient 
regarding hemodynamic taban we have to do first uh, bci uh, before or after umbilical insertion then we reassess hemodynamic urine output lactate so maybe obscalate uh, uh, the devices mm -hmm. to add intraortic balloon bomb or add ecmo uh, to this kind of patient uh, you know that uh, in hospital time, uh, we have not to, to do any delay to insert, if, we, if there is an indication uh, to insert uh, any mechanical uh, support device, we have to do it in short time because any delay, it will be reflected in the mortality in significant way as it, uh, is it clear in this meta-analysis of a huge number. Uh, so, uh, timing of short-term mechanical early or late, uh, we have to know that door to support in acute myocardial infarction complicated, this is meta-analysis published recently, uh, which in patient with ST elevation MI and recruited uh, a huge number of patients from, uh, uh, from many retrospective study and one randomized study. And the conclusion that short-term mortality was reduced in patient receiving pre-BCI and Bella support from 37.2% uh, uh, versus uh, 53.6%. Uh, 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 so uh, significant reduction of mortality when we uh, recruit uh, l l l devices earlier pre-BCI and this extend to midterm mortality benefit uh, also uh, uh, the same, uh, not only in short time, but also in midterm benefit. So, uh, conclusion in Bella Breyer to BCI in acute MI cardiogenic shock may have a positive impact uh, on short and midterm mortality compared with both BCI uh, placement, but as we know, no safety concern about device-related bleeding and uh, limb ischemia. Uh, I will manage uh, mentioned to two special kind of uh, cardiogenic shock uh, with presenting with acute MI, which is RV uh, infarction, uh, and which is maybe complicated with RV MI, especially if the patient uh, having uh, 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 having complete heart block. Uh, in Bella RV, may we get benefit, significant bene benefit, because as you know, RV MI and cardiogenic shock, RV usually recover in short time uh, if, we, uh, if we did uh, BCI and reperfusion therapy for the infarct-related artery. Uh, the recover time period regarding RV, it is uh, much, much faster than uh, LV. Uh, uh, finally, I will mention to the mechanical complication uh, which may due to the ventricular septal rupture or babillary muscle. Uh, in this kind, in this kind of of patients, usually the uh, uh, ventricular septal rupture have been within 24 hours, but may up to two weeks, and patient may get benefit. This is the only patient, uh, special patient may get. Uh, a great benefit from intraortic balloon bomb before doing the surgery because it is better uh, to postpone the surgery for uh, two to three weeks uh, after uh, after fixing the uh, septal defect. The same uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, babillary muscle rupture, which may uh, happen. Uh, during uh, two to seven days. But in this case, also we can get great benefit from intraortic balloon bomb. But in this case, we have to do surgery as early as possible, not like VSD rupture. So in conclusion, the use of 
temporary mechanical circulatory device in cardiogenic shock has increased dramatically despite a lack of a robust randomized control trial or evidence su suggesting a significant improvement in mortality. What about guideline about using these uh, devices? Uh, 2016, the recommendation it was that short-term mechanical circulatory support may be considered in refractory cardiogenic shock, uh, depending on patient age, comorbidities, and the neurologic function. But in 2021, the, re uh, the recommendation upgraded to 2A, but now maybe by the end of 2023, and because of the lack of the evidence, maybe, and I am afraid to be considered uh, as 3A as a routine use, because we have till now not having uh, enough evidence supporting use this uh, circulatory devices. So in conclusion, uh, uh, mechanical circulatory uh, support devices selection should be individualized uh, to the patient according to the shock severity. It is used only in type C, D, E, and according to shock phenotype, it is regard due to the acute MI or decompensated heart failure. If it is the type of device, if it is unilateral ventricle or biventricular uh, 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 and should be guided by invasive hemodynamic and device avail uh, availability and even also uh, operator uh, experience. Multidisciplinary shock team approach is must. Importance of shortened onset of shock to support time if indicated uh, in uh, the similar time fashion to door to balloon in ST elevation MI also is must. Thank you for your attention and sorry if I exceed the time. Thank you, Dr. Ababa. <clears throat> Any questions from the panelists? May I have a sh short question? Uh, we yes. saw from your lecture that uh, the combination of the supporting device is very interesting, but both studies include ECMO as one of the combination. How about the use of two unloading devices such as IABP plus, plus Impala? Is there any evidence of using two unloading devices? You mean what is Impala plus what? Plus IABP. IABP. Intraortic balloon bump. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, it is indicated uh, sometimes, especially uh, if the patient develop uh, like heart failure or pulmonary edema, because as I mentioned before, uh, all uh, other uh, devices like Embella or VA ECMO, it increase the afterload. So may precipitate pulmonary edema. And these devices, uh, should be, when used, uh, should be yeah, controlled uh, by hemodyna hemodynamic and closed monitoring. So if patient develop increase in wedge pressure and uh, any signs of heart failure, uh, this should be, uh, and there is some study uh, supporting that uh, compared with uh, ECMO alone or ECMO plus intraortic balloon bump. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And because time is up and uh, I have to make a short closing and uh, I have to show my special thanks to the four speakers and uh, their excellent presentations. We learned a lot about how to choose adequate therapy in each disease entity. However, we still have some puzzles in each disease entity. I think the unsolved questions should be answered 
by the future studies and the randomized clinical trials. And finally, I have to say thank you to Dr. Raj Bangshi as the co-chair and uh, Professor Jun Lin as the program director. And uh, thank you all again and hope to see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.